So I want to ask you, what if I told you that not everyone experiences God in the same way? Would you believe me? And have you ever thought that possibly that you needed to recover from religion? <laughs> so as I was writing um, my, my first book, or my second book, Spiritual Reliability, I actually almost entitled it Spiritual Reliability, Learning to Recover from Religion. And I was told by one of my mentors to not do that because it could be off-putting to people. But that's just one of my thoughts and one of my experiences that I've experienced as a human living in the world. So whatever you were told is your pathway to God, it's not, it doesn't matter because it's all about us creating that pathway for ourselves. So perhaps you heard things like go to church, pray, beg, wish, barter with God, read scriptures from the Bible, maybe go on a mission as a missionary, or go be quiet in a place of practice, or become a member of a church uh, with a particular dogma which you did not resonate with. So a lot of us, I think, have experienced that, where we were pushed into a direction that our family possibly thought we should go to. Or, you know, we've heard that from even the world within itself, and it didn't really resonate with anybody or yourself. So you go, and you search, and you seek, and then sometimes we don't really realize that this is not my place, and I've experienced that within myself, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. So many of us were born into families that told us or taught us to believe in certain ways which were never right for us. So due to these situations, we may have felt as religion was crammed down our throat, and due to these expectations, you may have ran into uh, from religion, which then left you unanchored in life and devoid of any spiritual connection at all. So what I know about this is that so many people that have come to my programs, because we are a spiritual development program with other things, is that people come in and they say they're offended by the word God, right? And so one of the things that I say is that what if we could reframe it and use the word God, universe, spirit, whatever it is that works for you. But the key to this is that it's about your God of understanding, not what people think or tell you you should do. And when I speak that out to my students, there's like a relief that happens because they're like, oh, I can call it whatever I want. But when we're running in the world, without any sort of anchor or being more to something that is greater than ourselves, then we sort of wander aimlessly in our life with nothing that's supporting us or this belief that it's all about us or it's all on us. And we have to really get that you can't do this alone. No one can do this alone. And when you think that you can do this alone, you're left wandering through the world with your own meager little way thinking you can do it all alone. And the truth is, is that you can't. You could try, but it gets much harder if you don't connect to something greater than yourself. So one of the principles that I have taught for many years is that all problems come from separation. Therefore, the solution is connection. So if we think about this, that all problems that we have are about us feeling that we're alone in the world or because the world beats us down, so to speak, or our families run away from us or they judge us or whatever it may be. We go through a relationship and it breaks up. Whatever it may be, that the key, the remedy, the, the prescription for this is to step into relationships, is to step into people that'll actually support us and get us. And I think that we all do this where we, where we retreat, we turtle into ourselves, And we under, have to understand that when we step into relationships, this is the classroom for the Holy Spirit. This is where the growth happens. And without r relationships with others, we don't grow. And relationships can be very, very um, painful at times but we have to move into that and lean into those relationships and ask those higher questions like, what can I learn from this relationship? So being a transformational educator and the founder of Seattle Life Coach Training 
Our program is personal, professional, and spiritual development program simultaneously. And what it means is that we do not claim any monopoly in any religion. But we do believe that everyone has their own God of understanding, and each person should develop their own pathways to their higher power. My students ask me, I ask my students all the time, to what is their God of understanding? And the answers that I get are radically diverse. So some will call it God, Spirit, Jesus, Lord, Buddha, Balahula, angels' wings or heaven's doors, Muhammad, your own mind, your own soul, your zodiac sign, the universe, Mother God, Father Time, but whatever name you give it, it's all one power. So today we're going to explore the nine spiritual pathways to your higher power or to the divine. And I want to just tell a quick story about my pathway to God. And so I was living here in Spokane um, back in the 90s, and I had a little restaurant job, most of you know, at the restaurant called The Onion. And it was the downtown Onion. And I was like probably 24-ish, maybe, I'm thinking. And I got hired and by a woman named Leslie McHenry. I cannot ever forget her. And I remember one day I was working and I walked in. I was in a funky mood and I wasn't happy with my life. And she said, what's going on with you? And I said, I'm just, you know, I was in some story, I'm sure. And being entitled 24-year-old, right? And she laughed and came back and she handed me this book. And she said, you need to read this. And I thought to myself, what do you mean I need to read this? It kind of annoyed me, actually. Have you ever had somebody hand you a book and say, you need to read this, right? And I'm like, you know, kind of like, how bold is that? And I remember looking at the book, and it said, A Course in Miracles by Marianne Williamson. So I don't know, I'm sure all of you, I heard giggles, but I'm sure a lot of you know this book. And I remember thinking, oh, miracles, this must be a religious book, this must be a, you know, a Bible book, this must be something about you know, me connecting to, my, to a God, which I didn't believe in at the time. And I remember looking at it, and I just remember the word miracles, and I literally grabbed it, and I said, well, thanks, and I threw it under the podium at the restaurant. And I just walked away. And Weeks had gone by, and I was in another funky mood, and I went to work, and I thought, you know, I could use a miracle today. And I remember opening the door of the podium, thinking, is it possible that book's still there? Because there's all this ketchups and mustards and just different things that we put in there. And I reached back in the back, and I find the book. But it has, like, ketchup on it and mustard. <laughs> and it was, I was like, okay, it's still here. So I put it, pulled it out, stuck it in my backpack, and I left and went home. And I remember two, three weeks went by again. And I remember laying on the couch. I was sick one day. And I heard, you know what? It's time for you to open that book. And I reached into my backpack. It was at the bottom of my book, or the, the backpack. And I pulled it out. And it was just tattered. And the, everything was just a mess. But I knew the content was still the same. And I sat down and I opened that book. And it was like I was reading a menu with all my favorite things on it. And I remember just sitting there and going, oh, wow. And everything began to resonate with me. And I read it like in two days. And I remember my mind was blowing. So what I will tell you is that that was my entrance into God. That was my entrance into what made sense to me for the very first time. And this was what put me on my path of where I am today. So I just want to just go on and just talk about um, that, again, everyone has their own spiritual pathway, and that whatever pathway that you take, it's, it doesn't matter, because as long as it's moving towards a place of love and harmony and joy and peace and compassion and empathy, it's all good. So let's go through the nine spiritual pathways. And I want you to, as, we, as I move through this, I want you to really stop and think about what is your pathway. And what, what a pathway is, is that each of us has our own way of connecting with spirit. Each of us has a way that's different. 
My pathway is not your pathway, and et cetera. No one's pathways in this room is the same. So how do we hear spirit? How do we connect to, to our God of understanding? And how do you know when you hear it? So let's go through, and I want you to think about your, what you think is your pathway to God. So one of the first ones is a naturalist, and this is loving God in the outdoors. And it says, some people experience God in nature, and the naturalist seeks to leave the formal architect of the padded pews to enter an entirely different cathedral, a place that God himself has built, the outdoors. Any place that has some trees or a stream or at a minimum open skies can be God's cathedral. Naturalists have found that getting outside can literally flood parched hearts and soften the hardest souls. Naturalists often learn their best lessons in the outdoors. So it's interesting because if you think about, you know, when I'm outside, I get a connection with nature and I get connection to the air and the trees and the ground. And I believe that that's God's cathedral. That's when that was created by something greater than ourself. It's amazing to me when I'm there. The second one is a, called a sensate, which is loving God with our senses. And it says sensates are, are moved more by sensuous worship experiences that by anything else, that sensation of it creates that. By sensuous, we're referring to the five senses, things like taste, touch, smell, sound, and sight. When they embrace the use of their senses, they open up entirely to a new avenue of worship. God created our senses, enjoyment through the senses, and they, they see God in beauty, creativity, art, and by touching, creating, and being in an ex, in experience. So it's about you know the feeling, the smelling, the seeing, the experience of it. And that could be a possibility of a pathway to your higher power. The third one is traditionalist pathway. And traditionalist is loving God through ritual and symbol. So religious practices are the way men and women use physical world to embody non-physical spiritual truths. There are three elements of the traditionalist pathway. Ritual, which is a public or communal workshop or, or worship symbol, a significant image, and a sacrifice. So this is more like Catholic or different types of um, religions that tend to be about worship, like at a cathedral. And they seek to find the spiritual lessons in all things, and they look for God in all things, as in, even in this, God is. So they are seeking, that's a way they connect to it. And it's, again, traditionalist, so maybe you resonate with that. The next one is ascetic, and that's loving God in solitude and simplicity. So the ascetic people gravitate towards solitude and simplicity and minimalist and deep, quiet commitments. It's the monk archetype or the, the, te the temperament of a monk, so to speak, representing believers who aren't afraid of discipline, severity, and solitude. The three elements awaken their soul to God's present, and ascetic experience God away, away from the world distractions and have no need for anything other than to be quiet, connect with God, universe, and spirit. I know for myself that ascetic for, for me is really a great pathway for me, but some people can't, cannot deal with the silence and they have a hard time spending time in the silence. And maybe it's because they hear their own mind, their, their own racket, and that it's not easy to sit in that. And sometimes it's not easy because you hear the voice of God or you're hearing your intuition. So who knows what your possible pathway is. This one shocked me when I was doing research. So the next one is activism. And I remember when I was going, wow, is that a possibility? That, and Martin Luther King, right? That's what I was realizing, that that was what his uh, mission was or his ministry was to be an activist for um, loving God through confrontation. It's not an interesting word, confrontation. So activists love God by standing up for righteousness and justice. Activists need to find the right balance, right? Indeed, the balance modeled by Christ who regularly interspensed times of spiritual intense ministry. Activists can take the form of Christian activism or social reform or to conduct an error or evil. 
writers, preachers, politicians, academics, artists, and homemakers can all be activists. They are faithful to their own beliefs and stand for what they believe is their truth. Activists will never be satisfied playing it safe. They need to experience the exhilaration of seeing miraculous in God through the, uh, the miraculous um, ways of being with using their voice. And so it's about really getting out there and speaking up for a cause of what it is that you believe in and to really move into having a voice and having that experience and having that ability to be able to use your voice in a powerful way. But I think that what's important in this activism archetype for your pathway is that you learn grace, right? Because I think that what grace, I believe grace is, is that you're not too little and you're not too big, that you live in the middle, that you know when to flex, you know when to dim, you know when to be a blowtorch and to be a candle, you know this. And I think that activism takes all forms of that because if we're too much, our voice isn't heard. And if we're too little, our voice isn't heard. So you need to know what your energy is when you start to be in the activist. This is an easy one, caregivers. So loving God by loving others. And caregivers find and grow towards God through acts of mercy and service to others. And when serving others, they are showing their God for love. Caregivers hear spirit more clearly when they're caring for someone that they sit with and quietly in prayer. Caregivers have found that one of the most profound ways that they can love God is by loving others. For caregivers, giving care isn't a chore, but a form of worship. So I think that caregiving is a powerful because caregiving is people like hospice and nurses. Um, I know for myself, I've done some hospice work, and it is the most amazing, profound experiences when you sit with people that are transitioning. Um, and I do see and feel God in those moments. The next one is enthusiasts, and that's loving God with the mystery and the celebration. So enthusiasts enjoy a celebratory form of worship as well as many of the more supernatural forms of faith. People with this spiritual temperament like to let go and experience spirit's energy through excitement and awe. Events like the Burning Man or concerts or festivals with spiritual energies. One of them that I remember is the Oregon Country Fair. Has anyone ever been there before? And it's awesome. It's down by Eugene. And it's very much about that experience that you just get, you're in the, in the middle of it and all these amazing things are happening. And I definitely felt spirit there. So enthusiasts experience God by dancing in the mystery and they understand that there is a certain thing about life we simply can't fully understand. So for me, it's about learning to dance in the mystery, that we learn to get that life is a mystery and that we get enthused by the mystery of it and not knowing all the time. So they are the open to spiritual world and they believe in God who is a, who's powerful and who acts with exciting ways. So maybe that's you. I don't know. The next ones are the contemplative people, and that's loving God through adoration. And the contemplative person seeks to understand and adore the spirit, the spirit of God while they seek to serve. Others seek to celebrate, and others seek to explain the concept of God. The contemplative likes to gaze longly and lovingly into the face of the universe and be caught up in awe of life. Contemplatives live for a deeper connection to life, and they want nothing more than some privacy to gaze upon the awe and the wonder of life and all the deliciousness it has to offer. So that's definitely one of mine, is just sitting and really contemplating on the bigger concepts of life and trying to understand you know, this giant big thing called life and spirituality. And lastly are the intellects, or the intellectuals, that's loving God with the mind. So intellects or intellectuals feel that, uh, that growing in Christ, they need to have their minds stimulated by scriptures and other reading materials and intellectual knowledge. And they, need to be, and they need to be challenged. If they're not learning new things about God, universe, spirit, their relationships will feel stagnant. And intellectuals remind us of the high calling of loving God with our mind. So those are the nine spiritual pathways to your divine, to your higher power. And I'm not sure if you've ever thought about that before. Like, you know, how do I find my higher power? 
How do I find my connection with the, the universe, with the divine, with your higher power? And I know that for myself, that when I got this, and I really understood it, that I was more on path when I went to those places that made more sense. So I'll talk more about that in a minute. So let me just tell you what my six, I'm not gonna go through all nine, but I, there's a test that I'm, I'm gonna be presenting and Amber and I are working out the details right now of a class that I'll be teaching sometime in the spring. And it's gonna have to do with um, developing your spiritual gifts and you're developing your pathways. And in this course, I'll be teaching you, we'll learn about your particular pathway and how you know how to get on path. So first of all, for my pathway is, first I need to get ascetic. So for me, I need to get quiet. Next, I need to become contemplative and I need to process what I'm hearing. Then I intellectualize and I research and I read and I fact find. That leads me to a sensei and the information I've received gets me excited and express it through music and cooking and even creating something. That leads me to, to, to nature to get grounded and see the beauty of walking and hiking and swimming and seeing the wildlife. And then I get enthused because that whole process gets my energy up and it raises my vibration. And so that's what's exciting because I know my pathway and I know exactly what I need to do. And I know the first step for me is become an ascetic. And maybe that's, that's, maybe that's meditation. But for me, when I'm going to ascetic, it literally means for me, drop to the floor. And that's what I tell myself is drop to the floor. When I'm spinning and I'm in chaos and my center of who I am is an anxiety or wonder or worry, I'm aware to say, Rich, drop to the ground. And when I do that, that means I sit in one spot and I get into a meditative pose and I just breathe and I just get quiet and I allow myself to hear what it is I need to hear. And my intention always is to find my center because when we find our center, nothing can knock you off balance. The world of effects are going to spin around you always, but we got to find that place of our center. And at that point, we can find our center and then begin to walk into our pathways. But that's my pathway, so who knows what yours is. So I want to just bring to you um, a, a five-step process that possibly would support you in your pathway to God. And then I think once you receive it, that it's going to help you stay centered in your pathway um, and so let's look at how you can connect to your divine. So the process to consider is called a spiritual mind treatment. It's affirmative prayer, prayer and it comes from the teachings of the science of mind. So I am, a, I am a practitioner of science of mind, and I've been doing this work for you know, 20 years of the science of mind, which is the um, teachings of Ernest Holmes. And I love the fact that unity and science of mind are so closely connected, they're sister and brother. So here are the five steps that you could possibly contemplate to be, once you get on your pathway, to affirm it and to keep it connected. So I want you to re realize one through five, it really means the acronym is, are you ready to receive? And that's what we're up to in this. So the first step is the recognition. And it is that you say, God is, and you call it by name. For me, it's about what do you claim it to be? What do you know it is? What is your God of understanding? So when I say God is, God is, God is the universe, God is spirit, and God is an omnipresent being that's everywhere and everything. That's what I call it. So it's like grounding myself in my truth. The second process is unification. I am one with all things, and I'm always connected to my God of understanding no matter what. So sit in that. You know, the world's spinning, and we get into these, this human struggle with our life, whatever's going on. And the component to this is that I know that I'm unified, and I'm always connected to my God of understanding, no matter what. No matter what. Is that faith? Yes. Is, and I define faith as learning to walk in the fog. We're all fog walking right now. So we've got to get that God is in everything, and I unify myself with that higher power. The third step is realization, and it says that 
all that God is, I am. I expect and accept and say yes to prosperity, guidance, no matter what, and harmony, health, and love. So think about that. My realization, your realization could be, again, that all that God is, I am. And I expect and accept prosperity, guidance, harmony, health, and love. What a powerful realization. And the last one is, or the second, third, fourth one, sorry, is thanksgiving. And it says, I'm grateful for my perfect connection with my higher power, and I know I'm always supported. So it's very connected to unification or the realization, but it's about being grateful, this awareness that these four things above are my truth. You're not alone. The universe is constantly supporting you if you just pay attention. The universe has your back. And lastly, this is the hardest one for most of us, is release. And I know for myself, this is my work, is releasing my attachment to the outcome, releasing my expectations of how I think it should be. Because the universe has a bigger mind than we do. It has a bird's eye view, and it knows more than we do. And so when we're pushing things to happen in our life, and you keep getting these blocks and these detours, I always say angels will open doors and angels are going to shut doors. And if the angel shuts the door, then we probably should listen, right? Because we don't want to have that thing that we pushed into existence generally. So the release is I let go and let God and I understand that everything is in divine order and divine timing. I know when I hold on too tightly, I squash the divine process. How many of you have kids? Anyone relate to this? This is the big piece, right? Is that if I hold on too tightly and I don't allow the process to unfold, then there is divinity even in that. And it's about that if I hold on, I'm going to squash it. It's about doing this. And it's about opening yourself up to, I don't know where this is going, but I release it into the law of God is done. And so it is. So I just want to end with, those are the nine pathways to your higher power. And when you seek to find your own pathway, you will get recentered, reinforce your connection, and move forward with renewed strength, vision, and purpose. So I just want to just once again reiterate that sometime in the spring, we'll be doing a virtual class, and it will be on the nine pathways and your spiritual gifts after that. And so learning how to really activate those, that intuition and using those gifts in a more powerful way. So in closing, I speak this to you. Everyone has a pathway to their higher power, but whatever pathway that you choose or whatever path or whatever name you get it, it's all one power. It's all one power. And it doesn't matter what you call it or how you got there as long as you end up where you need to be. And if this, what they say, is the wrong pathway, then was it the, really, was it the wrong pathway if it got you to where you are today? So part of this journey is this and this. And sometimes we end up coming up and out and we transcend our problems. And I would also end with all of our messes become, can become our message and all of our messes can become our ministry. And so part of our ministry or our message is to get that this was all part of the divine plan. And so I'm going to now take what I know and help others do the same thing. So please repeat after me this closing mantra. All is well. And all things. And that includes me. And every part of my life. Thank you, and so it is.